someone trying to get into the real estate market, this mastermind is for you. Whether you're an investor trying to see what's on the market to projects and founders that are trying to get insights or even get connected to VCs, you want to listen to this. Here we bring to you the biggest names in the industry to share their insights from these CrowdCreate masterminds. From best-selling authors to mortgage REIT funds, you're going to learn from people that are in the forefront of co-living here domestically in the United States to even internationally. We have two operators that are going to be sharing their thoughts and opinion, especially during this COVID 2021 market. Uh, so I really like what the community is doing to really sort of uh, connect and empower each other and stay informed during uh, times where it's a little bit difficult to have face to face meetings. So uh, without further ado, I'm uh, Kevin Maloney. I'm currently working with uh, Paul Larson, who's on the call. I'm bringing Paul in today to introduce him to the group and I'll yield uh, the delta of my time to him. Um, I'm, we're working on some opportunity zones and commercial real estate projects. Uh, real excited about uh, his firm and what he's built and his mission and vision. Uh, Paul will give you a little bit more information there. And uh, we were looking to connect with uh, institutional investors and family offices that are looking at uh, high quality, um, you know, um, opportunity zone and commercial projects. And, and just to give a quick, you know, sort of uh, set the stage for Paul, everybody else on the call, uh, Larson Capital, uh, Paul's the founder. It's a real estate private equity firm, and it's, uh, you know, focused on institutional investment quality projects, income producing, with a focus on commercial, office, and industrial. So that's my sort of quick intro, but I'd really like to have Paul, you know, go next and really give uh, him a little bit of time to talk about some of the, some of the details we're working on. Uh, thanks, Kevin. Um, good to uh, meet you guys. Heard a lot about this group and uh, actually met Kevin at an event in uh, YPO uh, thing that we did uh, about a year and a half, two years ago. And uh, just really great, high caliber real estate professional. So appreciate your all's time. Um, as Kevin mentioned, um, you know, I, I lead our company. I'm the CEO. We have um, about four and a half billion under management that we uh, facilitate uh, through our the common channels of wealth management platforms that we've worked with over years. And then uh, back in 2012, we launched Larson Capital Management with the idea that uh, we wanted to diversify uh, those public market assets into more uh, strategic uh, rate D products. And so, you know, we, we live in the world of, um, you know, sourcing and putting deals together. Uh, we've done co-investments. Uh, most of the stuff we do is general partner uh, uh, related. And then uh, we put the capital in place to, to acquire things. You know, COVID has been a, a major shakeup for all of us. And anytime you go into these kind of um, periods of time, it, it creates opportunity. And, um, and so what we've experienced is um, office space, which was kind of our core on what we spent is where we manage primarily. And uh, we bought about 200 million of office last year even. Uh, what it's done is it's changed the, the um, underwriting a little bit on how we do deals. So we're looking for things that are typically larger credit tenants. Um, we've got a $650 million portfolio that we're looking at acquiring right now. Uh, so that's a big project that's in place. And uh, the reason why it's coming to market is because the current owners that put this portfolio together, these big credit tenants of industrial and office, they want to get to a more opportunistic play which is awesome uh, because that means they have to uh, get out of this portfolio um, and bring in somebody else who can assume all of the debt, the CMBS debt. So uh, what we're doing is um, essentially we're, we're looking to repackage that, put 160 million of equity together and uh, keep the current owner in at a pre uh, preferred equity round, uh, which is going to deliver, you know, conservatively our investors about a 10% yield cash on cash with an overall return of about 20 and so uh, COVID has basically created this opportunity because it pivoted uh, the other investors' uh, desire to move to a more opportunistic uh, play. Um, so that's, uh, that's a project. Uh, Kevin you know, alluded already, we, we are deep into the opportunity zone uh, space. We've got multiple deals. Uh, we work uh, the Anheuser-Busch family. There's two, two arms of that family. Um, and uh, we manage real estate for, uh, they outsource the real estate management to us on one half of that family. And uh, most of that's an opportunity zone deal. So we're, we're deep in the trenches on that. Um, but it's not because we uh, want to do ozones. It's because we already did real estate development. It just happened to be in an ozone. So anyway, that's, that's a high level. Uh, we've got 23 offices around the country. So uh, headquartered here in St. Louis, but people uh, all on, on the ground uh, around the country. 
That's awesome. Thanks for that, Paul. <clears throat> Anybody here have any feedback or questions? And maybe on the wealth management side, kind of interested, like what in, where institutional capital is flowing, if anybody has any insights here that they could provide. Tom Wheelwright, um, I know I follow your podcast religiously. I know you know a lot of that on the wealth and tax side. Um, do you know anything that's going on on that side? Uh, hey, I'm he I'm here to, to to listen to you guys and learn from you guys. So <laughs> I, I'm like soaking it all in. Very nice. Cool. Awesome. Well, um, you know, going next, um, Rob Seacrest uh, with Polaris Equity Group. Uh, I know you're also trying to talk to some big family offices, and uh, I don't know on the institutional side, but love to hear from you and what you have going on. Thanks, uh, Jeff, and, and pleasure to be here. So uh, Polaris is the first uh, institutional quality private lender that focuses on uh, acquiring and in, in, or lending to acquire and build out uh, commercial properties with cannabis use tenants. Um, we've been the leader in the sector since 2016, and uh, we converted to a private mortgage REIT uh, last year. And um, the first private mortgage REIT in the cannabis sector is going public at the end of this month. And we just got off the phone with them. Um, we're considering launching a second fund for a different loan product um, in the public market. So uh, it looks like uh, the SEC has approved uh, cannabis uh, to go on that there um, indirectly. So that was an interesting call that we just got off of. Um, our fund's focus is a, a no cost fund. We, we, we have a target of 15% IRR yield each year. We make monthly distributions, but I should say 20% on the on the income, but our yield recently has been in 24, 25%, and that's unleveraged. Um, our cost basis for our fund, what the borrowers have into it is at least equal to what, uh, what we're lending and they put their money up first. We have perfect performance on the assets. We've been audited for three years. We're audited by Cohen Resnick this last year. We're, we're, uh, we had, I think, 800% growth this year, even in spite of COVID. Um, and mainly those investors are what we consider retail investors that are writing checks for less than a million dollars. Um, we have one large fund in for a $25 million commitment. Um, we have several, sub, several smaller uh, family offices, and we're starting to finally talk to the bigger family offices. The largest in the, in the sector is we're in ongoing conversations with them, plus some European groups. And then we have a half a billion dollar commitment that we're considering taking on as well. So um, it's, a, it's, a huge, uh, it's a huge sector. We have the first proprietary database in the entire country for this asset class. So we know the, the size of, of the market, which nobody else knows. It's, it's such a unique field that nobody analyzed it or spent the money. And we did it over the last four years. So I'll just end it there. All right, nice. Rob, what are you most excited about in 2021 with, with the industry in general? Getting you guys out to the racetrack, that's that's all that matters to me. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so this year we'll see um, the new administration come in that is pro-cannabis. And so we believe that, um, that the coal memo will be reinstated or something similar within the first few weeks. That doesn't require an act of Congress. And we believe within the six, first six to 12 months, you'll see the federal policies be conflicted from the state policies. So you're gonna see a massive flood of capital come into this market. And it's the complete opposite of what the Canadian markets were where you had capital, but you had no businesses that had ever had any experience or operational um, uh, you know, range of what they had done. All of the companies in the US were all privately funded and virtually all of them are now EBITDA positive that are, uh, that if there's somebody that's worth looking at. Um, so we think that that'll, that massive flood of capital will come in uh, on the equity markets and uh, make the market that much bigger here in the United States. That's awesome. Thanks, Rob. I, I'm an investor in Polaris and have been for the last couple of years, and I speak very highly in terms of a risk reward. You're absolutely crushing it, Rob. How much uh, under management are, are you at right now in terms of a uh, our, our port, the fund's portfolio of income is based on 83 million of, uh, of notes. So that, that's what we're generating right now. Nice. Love what you're doing. Thanks, Rob. Uh -huh. um, there's another Rob in the room, Rob Beardsley. Uh, love to hear about what you're working on and uh, yeah, get an Absolutely. intro. Absolutely. So my name is Rob Beardsley. I'm with the founder of Lone Star Capital. We're a multifamily owner operator. Uh, by name focused on Texas suburban garden style multi. Uh, we have about 100 million under management. We're looking to double that in 2021. 
We also in 2020 launched a uh, prefer small balance preferred equity strategy, which is extremely unique, but for good reason. It's really tough to run uh, originating, you know, essentially equity loans of one to three million. It's a it's a space that's has no competition, but like I said, it's tough to uh, you know originate in service and find quality sponsors for that type of uh, for that type of product. But there's huge demand, and so the pricing is very attractive. Uh, so that that strategy, we're putting out capital at a gross rate of 15%, and uh, you know traditional preferred equity in the institutional space of five ten million dollar checks is more like 12 13%. So there's there's a good opportunity there, but our main, our main business is as an owner operator. Uh, so that preferred equity strategy has been in response to just high valuations, even in spite of everything that's happening in terms of operational headwinds. And then senior leverage has come down a bit due to underwriting constraints caused by COVID. I mean, maybe some of that has loosened up, but that's, uh, that's really where we saw the big gap in the stack and the opportunity. What we're, Working on, uh, like I said, our goal is to do 100 million of acquisition volume in 2021. We're looking at a few deals in Houston right now, um, as well as actually looking at buying out one of our partners, uh, a private equity firm, uh, to do to do a buyout with them. Amicable, but uh, but still interesting experience. And uh, what else? The in terms of capital on the capital side, 2020 was a big year for me to grow our family office and private equity relationships. It was kind of like the pendulum swung. We started our business with the family and friends in the retail, kind of were frustrated with that. We moved, uh, you know, really hard into institutional because thinking, oh, that's the solution. That's the way to go. Um, kind of frustrated by that and now swinging back to the retail. So kind of going back and forth in terms of our capital base, but I think it always makes sense to be diverse and have many different pools of capital to, uh, to choose from. So, so that's what I'm most excited about is all the new investor relationships that we have built and are going to build in 2021. And this group uh, is, is a very powerful way to do just that. So I'm excited to see how we can all help each other. Nice. Rob, is there anything specifically that the group can, can help you with in terms of uh, in your projects? I'd have to think about that a little bit more. I mean, obviously... Uh, you know, we're open to some, you know, LPs or JV equity, things like that, like most people on this call would be. So um, something I could think about more. Very nice. Uh, we are going to run a poll. Again, we want to leverage the wisdom of the crowds. And in this poll, it's going to be, you know, where's the best place right now to find accredited investors. And uh, we'd love to, you know, for all of you uh, that have successfully raised capital to uh, please vote. And um, yeah, so I actually, I met Rob very young, charismatic founder at an investor conference um, two years ago, and we've stayed in touch uh, ever since. Uh, El Elvina, if you, you don't mind sharing next, uh, another young and charismatic founder. We love what you're doing at Podshare, and there's some very interesting operators uh, here. I was going to say, I think I'm maybe the first of the operators to speak now at this point and talking about 80 million in assets. We just bought our first building at 1.8 million. I mean, that's a fraction of what Congrats. you all are talking about. But it did take us nine years to get. Um, we basically have eight leases, commercial properties. And for the first out of the nine years, for the first three years, I solely operated one building and that M MVP took way too long to prove. But essentially, landlords were concerned about like the transient use, the wear and tear on the building. But after those three years and a bunch of press that kind of came down like BBC, LA Times, The Guardian, um, Business uh, Insider, like all NBC, Fox, like all these people started saying, People are paying how much to live in bunk beds? And the, the key figure was expensive neighborhoods. So there's a triangle at Podshare and it's like cost, neighborhood, privacy. And if you look at a motel, you get cost and privacy. But if you look at Podshare, you get cost and neighborhood. Because the fact is you can get yourself an $80 you know, motel in Inglewood, but with Podshare, you get yourself a $40, $50 custom bunk bed. Uh, I don't mean the Ikea. I mean the like wood, like stairway to the second level, personal TV outlet, nightlight in Venice Beach, Hollywood and Vine, downtown Arts District, a little Tokyo, um, downtown in the little Italy in San Diego. 
got San Francisco, that one from last year, and now we purchased one in San Francisco is a karate studio that we changed the use on. And that's kind of been like my MO is like taking retail spaces and converting them, which is a huge pain in the ass because I have to work with different, like I have to work not only with LA City, but I've worked with Santa Monica to convert an art gallery. I've, where I'm working with, uh, well, I've already got San Francisco. I converted uh, group housing from the karate studio I was telling you about. I converted a um, marijuana dispensary, Rob. You would have not appreciated that one. I, I took a marijuana dispensary off the market. <laughs> Technically, they took themselves off because they were selling a little bit more than marijuana. So they got they got shut down by the feds and then was vacant. It was called 213 Collective. And I came in. And that was a JV, the other Rob. Um, out of my eight locations, I only have one JV. Um, the rest of them, I master lease. And then, like I said, this one on Lombard Street, we just bought. Uh, will be the first one that an asset that we own which we can borrow against and put capital improvements into and not be pushed out you know the biggest problem for me is three percent increases on leases and triple net leases you know all these things tie, cut into my margins so much but that was always the game plan for me was lease up get the brand and then start buying kind of like in and out burger model and i do not have a finance background or as much knowledge as all of you guys on on uh banking and wealth management and private equity really it's just we're a brand for shared housing and uh it's just been a very interesting community growth uh very organically over time alvina thank you for that and the group here and i can vouch for everybody is very collaborative in terms of helping you in your career you're you're phenomenal at just user acquisition getting featured in the press yeah uh, there are links to Elvina's uh, company uh, in, in the chat, so feel free to uh, take a look. Uh, a good friend here, Kevin Maloney, he's actually working on micro units out of uh, San Diego that we can connect you with. Um, yeah, does anybody have any feedback or uh, comments for Elvina? Are these long-term rentals or month-to-month -month or nightly? So it's 50 bucks a night, 280 a week or a thousand a month. And you can jump around the network. So the concept is like a gym membership and like 24 hour fitness where if you get a membership, you still got the shower, the towel, but you share the equipment. Same thing with pods. You can jump around the pods. Um, you can go to a different pod share until 10 PM the next day, but there's no security deposit from them. It's landlords, but it's like from a city standpoint, really helps the low income folks. Um, especially during COVID, we've seen a spike in domestic use. Before we used to be 60% international, 40% domestic. Now it's 80%. And even that, I wonder who the heck is the other 20 because I seldom see anybody who speaks a foreign language these days, this 2020. But 2019 was a fantastic year for us um, in the years prior with a very nice hybrid of short and long-termers. But yeah, Rob, it's it, average length of stay when I first started was three nights. In 2019, it was um, three weeks. And in 2020, it was three months. So that really has been increasing. Um, and I tell you, it's because people can pay by the day or by the weeks. So when a traditional apartment makes you put down, you know, first and last, um, you know, proof of income, which a lot of folks don't have, uh, or a guarantor, Podshare just says, yo, use this like bridge housing, apartment hunt, roommate hunt, um, which is kind of detrimental to us because when they find those roommates, they leave us, you know, and that's when I think a future uh, multifamily uh, attachment would be great for us. It's like, oh, you're graduating from shared housing, come into our private apartments, you know, and it could be like a thousand for a shared, 1500 to 2000 for a private. So I do think there's legs there because they're already in our system and they're, and they're hungry for privacy after they've stayed with us. But there's a lot of lonesome folks that are also tired of the, of the private, like solitary experience and do want to go into a posture to meet people when, especially when they just come into a new city. I, I, a couple of questions, Elvina, very creative. Uh, are they zoned as hotels or multifamily? Uh, number two, uh, has COVID had an impact on um, just people wanting to live together and moving around, obviously breathing all over each other? And number three question, are you trying to own the real estate or, and then master lease it up? Uh, is that your play longer term? Uh, maybe talk to me about what the capital needs are, uh, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, so from the from the first, so it's a commercial, they're all commercial buildings. I don't touch multifamilies. The reason is because you can't technically legally go under 30 days. Now, a lot of our competitors. How's it zoned though? Huh? Is it, so this could, this Saunders doing something similar and master leasing. Is it zoned? Their zoning is commercial. Is that how you're, or I'm sorry, is a uh, yeah. hotel. 
Is that how no, you're known? I do like C2s and group housing. I touch this archaic use in the codes, um, like something like group housing, congregate housing. Um, it's it. a pain in the butt, but it takes me about 10 to 12 months to do. And then I'm off to the races for the next, you know, five to 10 years, mm -hmm. um, which is why I was telling you guys about that one JV is it's kind of like a chicken and the egg scenario with me. Like who's paying that rent for 10 months while we do a change of use with this Lombard property that I bought. They had a tenant. So I was able to have a very long escrow. The landlord gave me an affidavit to change his karate studio to group housing and boom, that guy's out. I'm in, but now I own it. So that was like the, that's the answer to your second question. I really need to start owning my, um, my buildings because the 3% increases is killing me. My margins, I have about a 20% net profit margin, but with those 3% increases and his property taxes, it just really starts cutting into my margins too hot, too high. Um, the second thing is, um, I'm so hotel use. I have two properties that are hotels, but mostly, like I said, they're group housing and they're always commercial. They're not residential use because I need to do the short term model. And then as far as COVID, so because of the pods, they have stairways, they were always built six foot apart because you got to have that, spe that space in between the stairs to get through. So ironically, the beds themselves are already six foot. That number was just like an ironic distance. But because of COVID, we've also been about a 50% occupancy, which sucks. Um, really, we, we made so much money in 2019. And by the way, when I say so much money, it's nothing compared to Polaris and all of you guys. But as far as operators go, we had a really great year. But that 2020 has cut into our profits of 2019. And we were still able to buy Lombard at a 70% LTV. So I had to put 640 down on, on that property, which I was not hoping to do because my model technically does qualify for an SBA if I get a change of use. So I was eligible for a 504 loan. And then with COVID, there was a bank moratorium on hospitality. And then I was able, eligible for a 7A, but then with the second shutdown, that fell through the cracks. So the only thing I could do was get this hard money guy to do a 70% LTV and then bridge out with, uh, with the local uh, group called um, uh, Harvest with, for a 7A later. But long story short, the commercial buildings, um, not multifamilies like Saunders. Oh, no, Saunders is big hotels, rooms, right? They do rooms. Yeah, we do like large, imagine a, a factory or a warehouse. No rooms, except for the bathroom. Awesome. Thanks, Ovina. And uh, yeah, happy to connect uh, everybody after as well and uh, continue the conversations. Uh, so we actually, we invited Elvina because she's, uh, we believe that, you know, pods and co-living is going to be the future or just gives uh, people more option uh, flexibility. Uh, June Rivers is actually calling in from uh, Asia, actually. And he's one of our favorite operators for capsule and pod uh, living there. I'm going to put a link to just the beautiful product that he's built out. But Juna, uh, would love for you to go next. Sure, thank you guys. So we actually built, have started our operation about five years ago and we focused mainly in Asia. We started in Hong Kong, now we have three locations there. Two of them are uh, licensed hotels and then one of them is a co-living operation. Uh, right now I am currently in Tokyo, um, spearheading in this market. We also had a team working in Bangkok. So it's a little micro uh, international living network uh, within Asia. And I think what really features our um, offering is that we built not just the operation, we built products out of this operation, both hardware and software. All of our capsules are IoT enabled uh, going on. Can I share screen actually? Wonder. Yes. Um, let me see. I think my Zoom. Actually, one second. Mm. Yeah, you should be a panelist, so you should be able to share a screen. Okay. Mm, one second. While he's doing that, I have to say the the way we met June and the project Sleep is because I stayed at one when I went to Hong Kong. So I love this experience so much that actually we, we became friends. <laughs> and uh, June looks like he's re... Looks like he's reconnecting right now. Just in this time, I think... Uh, oh, here oh, he here goes. Go. Here is his uh, smart bed that he built out. Great experience. All right, June, you ready? Yep, ready. So here we go. Um, can you see my screen? Yep. 
Perfect. Thank you. So a little bit about myself. I guess I'm a rare breed. I actually was trained as an architect, but then worked in the IT. So it gives me a perfect background to build IoT prefab products. Um, the products itself are award-winning um, in Germany and um, our operations, our spaces have been lead, the first uh, lead gold version four, uh, hospitality um, cred credited and some international uh, media coverage over the years, even though we're you know, all the way out in Asia. Um, this is the first part. This is the, um, the original design um, IoT capsules that we, we built. And what about the IoT of it? You know, it, look, it looks like a piece of wood. It looks like a block, really. Um, so I, when I was in graduate school, I started this concept. Uh, it was in a competition. And then we thought, what actually is the, what's people looking for when they travel around looking for a affordable but high quality? Ultimately, it's sleep. And then so I went to the medical school, school and talked to some professors, uh, asked for, you know, tell me what uh, help people sleep better and look at it. He just threw me half a dozen of his papers. He was actually an advisor for the US Navy on how to help the soldiers sleep better. Um, so I think they were, you know, quite reputable uh, basis. But then after at the end of the day, it wasn't any rocket science, mainly the three environmental factors, the lighting, the sound and the uh, airflow. One quite in invisible one, which I'm going to get to a little bit later, um, that we also address this. Um, and so with these, each of these capsules inside this, um, you know, eclipse lighting ceiling, there is the, the IoT computer that controls all the three factors that I just mentioned. And from there on, we have created Room, which is a focus office, actually also as a capsule, also has those environmental control factors in it. But this time, uh, it's a sofa bed. You can turn it into a double occupancy capsule, or you can turn it into a sofa with a desk that you work. Um, actually has some, become the favorite Zoom meeting place for our team and our uh, tenants. People fight for this room, like sign up for the whole day, using it for their private focus work or their Zoom meetings. So it has a soundproofing or sound damping effect of about 15 decibels. And then we have this chair that we developed for Thailand market. Uh, everybody loves Thai food massage, except that uh, you don't, most people don't like the feeling of being watched from the street and everybody walking in the store. And that's how there has been the way for this past, uh, I don't know, however long food massage has been invented. So we just basically use this IoT technology we did and a little bit of design to create more privacy and that people can adjust their own little and micro environment into say the Caribbean or the Himalayas. Um, and it's not just the sound in this case, it's the sound, the wind and the smell that we uh, cater for each. The smell is a aroma diffuser that we add to this small little space. So it's super uh, effective. We're working on some products such as this air room, we call it, uh, targeting our airport customers. And this is um, actually in the talk right now of uh, launching this product. But what really excites me in 2021 is this product called Fun. We partnered with a Japanese temple uh, of all business partners you could find, we found a temple who wishes to bring the um, Zen philosophy beyond the boundaries of um, traditional real estate, so to speak. So they're now we're partnering with this uh, Japanese Zen temple in Kyoto to create a fan life uh, camp, camper fan. And we're launching it actually this week, to, uh, tomorrow on crowdfunding on the Japanese crowdfunding site. So that's what we're working on. Uh, I mentioned one thing that I uh, we see as an insight about the sleep wellness. Uh, while you can control all these environmental factors, one thing that really, really uh, uh, by and large influence how people how well people sleep is familiarity. If you sleep in a different bed every night, um, turns out even if it's a really nice mattress, um, you might not sleep that well because it's just different. Um, in our case, we believe capsules and the environmental controller uh, creates this opportunity for really good sleep while you're on the go. Uh, when we do the software, it's not just for the user. On the left-hand side is a very minimalist uh, user interface if they choose to have advanced features. Otherwise, it's just a panel on, inside the pod that you can control. But if you scan the QR code, you get to set your light alarm, you get to see your mode, um, and it actually learns all of your preferences. Um, I, and on the right is the operator view. You get to, you see the, these are not um, 
so much user experience. These are actually operation needs. When you want to welcome a guest, so that oh, they ask, where's my bed? You hit the welcome and it starts blinking. Uh, when someone tries to bring a guest into the pod for the singular pod, that's actually forbidden. So we, the, the operator hits an alert button and it starts blinking red. So uh, ten nine times out of 10. And in fact, never, uh, in our history, it hasn't had 10 times of use. But anyway, when we do that, it basically stops it with uh, the most peaceful uh, way and very light burden on our operators. Thanks, Jude. I do want to leave this up for uh, comments and feedback from the rest of the sure. panel here. And also uh, happy to send you a uh, connect over your deck for anybody that's interested. But yeah, uh, thank you for, yeah. yeah, thanks, Jude. So from a real estate standpoint, does anybody have any feedback or, or comments for June and what he's working on? It is something new here for, for the states. Where are you placing most of these? You said the airport, um, are people buying flats and just dropping these things in? Or is it or is it commercial office space? Like where... Uh, Who's your who's your buyer? Currently, mostly uh, uh, residentials, and in Hong Kong, residentials are uh, able to get a guest house license, and the guest house functions uh, under under twenty eight days as well. Um, we're working with hotels as well now, like converting certain floors of hotels into pots, so that to create a wider diversity for the mix in the offerings. Yeah, so mainly that too, and then the transportation hub is what we really wanted to get into, but with a startup, it's quite difficult to get into an airport. If there's a partner who's you know, strongly well-connected in those spaces, that would be a really great partner. Yeah. What sort of HVAC system do you have on these things? Do you have to build a trunk line and then just drop in heating and cooling or how, how, maybe we can take that offline, just curious. No, no that's a great question. Um, so each of these beds, um, they have a cavity in between them. So if you have four, uh, eight beds together, this one common core is where you pipe one, uh, one main extract into it, and then it just distributes through soft pipes. That's how we do it for these capsules. So it's a pretty uh, non-intrusive extract, I would say. You know. So you can actually uh, do it uh, post, you know, as an upgrade to the system. You have to get UL certification because it's considered electrified furniture. <laughs> okay, this is a really good question as well. So we it's ship a pod, we, no a pod. Yeah, no, we ship. We have the, the IoT uh, part of it is EU certified, and the but we ship it as a separate product because otherwise to test this whole product is very uh, expensive. So these two things, the IoT uh, modules and the furniture module, are shipped separately and go through customs separately, and then on site we combine them to lower the cost of testing and and certification and all that. So June, you definitely win the cool factor you heard of here. Sleepbox? Yes, yes, I've heard of Sleepbox for sure. We're much, uh, much more beautiful, and. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I, 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 I'd like to know, June. What do you need next? What, what, what's, what's your next need? Okay, so um, as I said, we're now mainly focused in Asia, and by the way, it's four thirty a.m. right now. Um, uh, probably great. Jeff and Ivan have been have been a great um, friend, and we have been exploring the opportunities in the U.S. So we're looking for a concrete project in the U.S. If there's you know good funding, good location, uh, we would be extremely interested into launching it. Of course, 2020 have been difficult. I think actually uh, similar to Alvina's um, insight, uh, the long term stay has increased a lot for us in Hong Kong and uh, as well. But then the uh, the fact that I could not travel, none of our team could travel to the U.S. made it difficult for us to expand in, uh, to the U.S. in the 2020s. I think probably half of 2021 as well. But I think uh, now we accept the fact that this is how it's going to be. We'll just work very closely with our local partner and find a project in the U.S. to land it. Very nice. Thanks, June. And thanks for sacrificing your sleep, your REM sleep right now for us. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah. Tom Wheelwright, I'd love to have you go next. Uh, uh, thanks very much. Thanks so much for having me, guys. Uh, I, I, I've been on the, uh, the technology call. Uh, just a little bit of my background. Uh, I am a CPA. I run a network of CPA firms. We specialize in real estate. We actually specialize in uh, developers and syndicators as well as investors. And uh, our primary goal is to take a developer investor down to zero tax. That's our, that's our little magic piece. And um, just 
and I love everything that's going on here. I, you guys are amazing. I'm here to learn. So uh, we're what what we need actually is we're actually looking for more CPAs who are entrepreneurial, who want to do, uh, who want to act differently, who want to act like entrepreneurs. Uh, the challenge with the CPA profession is we're only about I don't know 50 years behind the times, and we tend to be very stagnant, very boring. Uh, the big, the big firms, I call them the cheesecake factory firms, you know, the big menus, low price, mediocre food. Uh, we're, we actually work only with, um, uh, small entrepreneurial CPA firms who can provide the highest level of service to the entrepreneurs. So we actually do focus only on entrepreneurs. We only serve entrepreneurs and that includes, uh, the real estate community is, is certainly our specialty, um, uh, some of you may know me as uh, Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Um, I travel with him all over the world, uh, not this year, but normally I would be traveling with him all, all over the world. was in Kyoto uh, a year ago mm. and uh, at some of those temples, uh, mm, actually right. with my brother who lives in China, who mm. uh, uh, lives in uh, Suzhou, China. Mm. And um, so we're, I'm just, I mean, frankly, I'm just thrilled to be here. Thanks, uh, Ivan and Jeff for having me here. Awesome. Thanks, Don. Um, what do you see as the biggest opportunity in 2021 from a real estate standpoint? Because I know you advise a lot of clients as well. Uh, uh, I, I actually think it's going to be uh, energy, okay, particularly clean energy. Um, remember that this is uh, Joe Biden. This is his number one priority outside of COVID is clean energy. And so I think that the real estate um, particularly the commercial real estate that focuses on energy, such as uh, I think actually gas stations. Um, I was looking at a gas station. I don't know what I was looking at. Um, it, oh, I know where it was. It was in um, the UAE and they had a gas station with all solar and uh, they were providing solar to run their gas station. But at the same time, you could obviously provide solar for charging. I think that's a huge market uh, that's going to be coming up in real estate. So it's just going to shift a little bit from uh, natural resource energy, such as oil and gas. And I think it's going to shift heavily towards uh, renewable energy sources. But to me, there's always a huge play there. Just like when we had cell phone towers start going up, that to me was a huge real estate play in this in the cell phone towers. Now we have a huge play in um in renewable energy. Thanks, Tom. We actually have a clean energy mastermind and lo love to invite you there. Oh, I'd love to. Through. I'd love to come to that one, Jeff. Thank okay. You. <laughs> I'd love to come to that. I'm, 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 I'm so, uh, I'm, I'm so excited about that. I, 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 I had a, uh, 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 I was uh, listening to a podcast with uh, Robert and a guest and the guest is in new into clean energy, came out of oil. And he said that what's really going to happen is, and Please don't be offended, any of you, by this. He said the socialists are going to pay for the clean energy, and the entrepreneur is going to make money on it. So I think it's a huge opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a whole other uh, discussion in clean energy. It's fantastic, though, the solutions that are coming to market and how people are. And 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 what you're going to see is, of course, where where I get get excited about it is because you're going to see a shift in the tax um, incentives right? Because the tax law is just a series of incentives. We got these big incentives right now uh, with, uh, I, I love the opportunity zones. I'd like to talk to you about that, actually, the opportunity zones, uh, but also the bonus depreciation, of course, which is the biggest thing since sliced bread in real estate should be. I actually highly recommend you start talking to your investors about the bonus depreciation and how to make sure they take advantage of the bonus depreciation. Too many people still investing in, in syndications and real estate through their IRAs because they think, oh, but uh, you know, I'm not going to get the losses anyway, which is a huge mistake. That just means they have the wrong, wrong CPA. That's all that means. So um, there's, there's just this enormous opportunity in real estate right now from a bonus depreciation. What we're going to see is we're going to see a combination of that with tax credits and other uh, deductions that are towards the, the uh, clean energy side. So you just see a, a little, a, a gradual or an maybe fast movement that direction towards the tax incentives for clean energy. That's awesome. Thanks, Tom. Um, Paul Moore, I know that you run a syndication yourself. Would love for you to uh, introduce yourself. To yeah, me. thanks, Jeffrey. Well, I am kind of boring here. I, uh, I'm really honored to be on such a distinguished panel. Um, 
I will tell you that I was an entrepreneur. I wanted to put serial entrepreneur on my business card for years. And I found out later that was really hurting me because as I transitioned from being an entrepreneur to more of an investor, I realized I wasn't an investor at all. I was a speculator. And I didn't know that investing is when your principal is generally safe and you've got a chance to make money. And when speculating is when your principal is not at all safe and you've got a chance to make money. And so I became this investor who was actually an entrepreneurial investor. And I found out over the years that I was making a lot of mistakes. In fact, I even started a podcast called How to Lose Money. And we've interviewed 230 some successful entrepreneurs about their pain and losses along the way to the top. I heard a quote uh, from Paul Samuelson, the first economist to win the Nobel Peace Prize from the US. And he said, investing should be like watching grass grow or watching paint dry. If you want excitement, take $800 and go to Las Vegas. And I realized that's how I was investing. So I became very boring. Uh, we invest, our company Wellings Capital has put together a fund and multiple funds that allow retail investors to invest in a diversified group of assets that are generally recession resistant. We found that self-storage and mobile home parks over the last few decades have been quite that. And uh, we found out in COVID last year that uh, the same thing, that uh, they were quite recession resistant. Mobile home parks are the only asset class that have uh, decreasing supply and increasing demand every year. And like Tom Wheelwright said, they have massive bonus depreciation that we can take advantage of. Uh, Self-storage is another asset class that does well when there is time, when there are times of turmoil and movement and downsizing. And so we're seeing all that. Uh, what do we need right now? We consider ourselves a due diligence firm. We do a lot of the due diligence that a retail investor would love to do and a credit investor would do if they had the time and the knowledge. Our goal is to identify the top few percent of recession resistant asset uh, managers uh, proper and, and invest heavily with them uh, and give our investors a diversified group of assets as a result. We have 76 assets in our current fund. Uh, we've had uh, outsized returns. Some of the uh, operators we work with have done an amazing job finding mom and pop opportunities that should be almost, you know, at an institutional level. And when they make, they, they do the difference, you know, when they do the work to get it from mom and pop to institutional, I mean, the last one we closed on uh, had a 344% IRR in December, and that was only held for 10 months and uh, quadrupled the equity. So, Tremendous uh, opportunities like that. Those don't come along every day, but we do have a number of those in our fund right now. Awesome. Thank you. Any questions or for Paul? Paul, where do you find um, your places to invest? We work really hard to find operators. Our default is saying no, Alvina, and we, um, we look on crowd platforms. We look on, uh, we rarely find them there, but we have found operators there. We have found operators through word of mouth. We've uh, run into a handful of people who do something similar to us in the last few years, and we're sharing information. And what check sizes do you guys write? I noticed that's like a question for seed A's. It's like they have yeah. a max check size. Not that, and it's such a weird thing to say. It's like, what's in your wallet? It's such a kind of a yeah. weird question, but um, does yeah. that, do you guys have a norm? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, last year we did anywhere from 700,000 to 21 million. And uh, we try to get, we try to hit an average of about half a million per property. And so if we're investing in a portfolio of 10 properties, we might consider giving them $5 million. Very cool. Well, thanks. Yeah, moving on to the residential side of things, uh, Kyle Stoner would love for you to uh, go next and introduce yourself. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, my, my name is Kyle Stoner. I'm the founder and CEO of Abode. Uh, we also own a brand called usrealty.com. 
Um, we're focused on flat fee real estate. Uh, so all of those uh, people and institutions that want to sell a home, um, but don't want to pay the traditional sort of 6% real estate commissions. Um, we do thousands of these. Um, and one of the things that makes us different is I think we have an edge with, with respect to customer acquisition. Uh, we're acquiring customers uh, much more cheaply than our competitors typically. Uh, and we're, we're marketing not just one-to-one, -one, but one-to-many. Uh, we service um, private equity firms, REOs, institutions that need to sell you know, dozens, uh, hundreds of homes at a time instead of just a uh, consumer that will be selling um, one, one home at a time. Um, what are we excited about? Uh, so we are, this is the tail end of closing out our seed round. Uh, we've gotten investments from um, Morgan Stanley, Revolution and others. Uh, and we're using these funds to grow the company significantly. We've been really bootstrapped in the past. So it took us a while to figure out um, how do we get licensed in every single state? How do we get the workflow in a way that's fully compliant with all the different local you know, laws and regulations and how to do that efficiently? Uh, now we're, we're, we're quite good at that. Um, and now it's about scaling. Um, so we're raising capital, um, trying to get to that point where we're doing you know, close to 10,000 uh, listings on an annual basis in the next year or so. And to put that in perspective uh, for you, you on this call, you know, when, when Redfin went public, they did about 48,000 total transactions uh, buy side and sell side. And so for us to get to that sort of 10,000 level, we, we feel like we're actually, you know, we're really starting to have a real impact on the industry. Although there are like 7 million homes that are sold every year, we're still very small, uh, but, but we know that we're kind of going in the right direction. Um, where we, we, we need help is um, a couple of things. We're always looking for introductions to uh, new channel partners. These are, again, um, asset managers, private equity, REOs. Um, we service actually other websites. There are other websites that need help with flat fee listings. Uh, we're one of the only companies that can really do that and do it at national scale. Um, and we're looking for, you know, even though our, our round is pretty much fully committed, we're still looking for a couple more investors, specifically strategic investors. Um, it's one of the reasons we went with Morgan Stanley. They have a really large, you know, over $90 billion portfolio in, in real estate. So we're looking for, for connections to uh, not only uh, firms and people that want to list and sell their homes, um, but also institutions that can invest and, and partner with us. Um, and that's pretty much it. Uh, happy to answer any questions. Awesome. Thanks, Kat. Our last mastermind, we had on 15 real estate podcasters and we'd love to get you in front of them because they talk about, you know, buying, and selling a home, we could get you exposure. And then uh, Revolution, Clint Myers is, is actually a friend of ours and he was uh, on these two. Oh, so I don't okay, know how you okay. met uh, Revolution, but Elvina, uh, he would actually be a good fit for you because they invest in, you know, these uh, game-changing real estate um, companies too, so. Amazing. Uh, about, you never got funding, because Podshare is self-funded, you are too, right? We're not fully self-funded. We do have some outside, um, you know, angel investors, but this is our first institutional round uh, that we're raising. Very nice. We need a prop tech mastermind next to just highlight all the mirrors and shakers of the new technologies and bring in investors. So, yeah, that would be awesome. And, and what, thank you. I would love to connect with the, uh, the, the, the podcasters you mentioned. I've done, I've done a couple. They're always like, it's always really interesting. Yeah. Very nice. Awesome. Um, I do. I, I was gonna say, oh, you mentioned Redfin. Um, do you know there's like a abode for commercial properties? Because I love Redfin and how they have that like flat fee. So um, for you know what you were talking about, um, but I would love to find that for commercial, like a LoopNet meets Redfin. Yeah, um, there is one, and actually, it's a friend of mine that has a company, but I'm just blanking on the name. Um, it is called. Especially because right now with COVID, I think so much retail is going to be up. So that's why, like, I don't know. Yeah, I think we're the only part, uh, group here that takes commercial, but yeah, let me, So as soon as we're done with this, I'll remember and I'll shoot you a note who it is. I'm just, I'm just blanking on the brand name, but there are a couple that are doing it. And there's one in particular that I'm thinking of. Cool. Well, mainly for office space though, not necessarily for what you're describing. So now but that I'm thinking about it. You can convert office space. We, okay. can we can take a commercial office retail and convert it to a pod share. Okay, okay. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll connect you. It has to be a standalone building, not like, you know, a giant building, but still. Got it. Awesome. Yeah. And uh, again, afterwards, we will connect everybody and just absolutely, you know, they're really the purpose of this is to help each other make introductions, get insights and whatnot. All right. So now we have uh, Antoine. I'd love to hear about your 
Of course. Awesome. Thank you so much for, for having me on here, Jeffrey. Um, my name is Antoine Martel. I own a company, Martel Turnkey. We're a turnkey rental property company. So that means we buy single family homes, renovate them, rent them out, put a property management company in place, and then sell those properties. We're doing anything from 10 to 20 houses a month right now in a couple markets, Memphis, Tennessee, Cleveland, Ohio, looking at other markets all the time, looking to expand. And then over the last five years also, you know, invested, took the cash kind of from the Martel Turnkey business and started investing in other, uh, in multifamily properties and, and stuff like that along the way and have a small little uh, family portfolio worth you know, 15, 20 million dollars now. And so what are you most excited about in 2021 and with the industry? And Yeah, so 2021 is going to be interesting for the residential space, record low inventory, even in our markets. I mean, you used to go to some of these zip codes and see, you know, 20 or 30 active listings. And now there's, you know, five or six. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see what happens with the, you know, when the foreclosure, you know, for loan forbearance program is up. And all these tenants, you know, with the eviction moratorium, when those, when all that ends and who knows when it's going to end with the new administration coming in, I don't know if they're probably going to extend that to who knows when. Um, but when that inventory comes back and floods the market, especially in the residential space, it's going to be, it's going to be really interesting to, to see what happens um, with our business, Marla. Hey, Antoine, I, I got a question for you. What, what do you think is going to happen when, let's say COVID's over, you know, we've had all of these people move out of the big cities. And so you've got all this, uh, actually you got, you know, decreasing prices in San Francisco and New York and increasing yep. prices in Utah and Idaho and, and so forth. What do you think is going to happen when COVID's over? Do you think they're all going to move back? I mean, are, are we going to have this big mass re-entry into the big cities? I don't think that's going to happen because COVID has permanently affected the way that workforce and offices work. So all the big tech companies, so I grew up in San Francisco and San Mateo actually. So, you know, Silicon Valley and all these companies now are work from home, permanent work from home. And so I think a lot of people that, you know, were in the Bay area or these very expensive markets, I mean, my parents sold their house in the Bay area in 2018. It was 1500 square foot house. They bought it when we immigrated from Canada for 600 grand and they sold it 20 years later for $2.2 million for a 1500 square foot home. And now that house that somebody came, bought that house, tore it down. And now the house, you know, who knows what it's worth, but it's, I don't, it's the property value has gone down a ton since that. Uh, I think it's gone down maybe 10% since 2018 to where we are today. Um, so I think the permanent work from home, especially all the young millennials, I just think like they're struggling here. I'm, I live in LA now. And I think a lot of people are struggling to, you know, when they graduate from college, they have to move back in with their parents because it is too expensive. And then they get this thing from their job that says, oh, it's permanent work from home. You can work from anywhere. And now a lot of friends, a lot of people that I went to college with, they're like, all right, I'm out of California. I'm going to Texas. I mean, a ton of people that got the work from home notice, you know, are in Lake Tahoe, they're in Texas, they're in Nashville now. And so I think it's only the, it's only the beginning um, because people to, are going to get used to that. To the low tax states, you mean, from the high tax yeah. state to the yeah. low tax just, <laughs> yeah. just checking. Yeah, that too. Yeah. Yeah. And you're seeing also a lot of high net worth individuals and big player. I mean, Elon Musk, Joe Rogan, all these people yep. moving to Texas, for example. And so I don't know, I think a lot of people are going to follow in, in their footsteps in the next five, 10 years. Thanks. Thanks, Anton. Uh, is there anything in particular that we can help you with? There's a lot of smart people on this call and well connected. Uh, yeah. I mean, we're always looking for, for more deals. So if anybody has any ways to go from 10 to 15 houses a month to uh, 150 houses a month, please. I would like information on scale and scalability and then also just money and, and raising money. We have a couple high net worth individuals um, and a lot of the companies self-funded um, just through family money now, which is nice. Um, you know, when, when we started, we were raising a ton of money and just doing joint ventures all the time, all the time to create cash and then slowly just started funding these deals ourselves. But, you know, to scale up, you know, it, it requires a lot of the big players that are much bigger than us, you know, are using these big bank lines of credits and stuff, which we just haven't, haven't been able to tap into. So kind of connections on funding and scaling even more if anybody knows anybody in that space, that's, uh, you know, 10 times the size of what we're doing. So. What's your buyer on your properties? Like, what's your exit? So you, you basically rehab, rent them out, and then you sell them as a block. Who, who's buying that? 
Yeah, so it's your typical W-2, um, you know, husband or wife. They have a small family. They don't want to invest in the stock market. They have 20 to 50 grand saved up in the bank, and they want to invest in real estate. You're selling a house, not not a whole truck. You're not, you're not blocking them together and then rolling them up into a piece. No, 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 no. No, these are all, these are all sold to, to, to single people. Um, and we, then we help them get financing, insurance, property management, we sell these houses for you know, right around a hundred thousand dollars. So anybody with 20, 25 grand in the bank can buy one of these properties already rented out property management in place, all that. And we kind of help them with all the things that are needed to get them into the game. How, uh, how many are repeat buyers? Like bought one, now I buy two and yep. three. Uh, 70%. Wow. And your wow. average ownership per user is like uh, two houses. Is the average ownership per user is two houses or 2.1. Yeah. Got it. Wow. Yep. Oh, Vita, you had a question. I'm just wondering, um, uh, what, what's the cap amount like you pay for a house, uh, mm-hmm. and then and then what do you sell it for after you rehab? Sure. It? So, so average over the last 250 projects is buying a house for 45 grand, renovate, renovating it for 25 thousand bucks, and then selling it for 80, 90, 100. Wow. Well, everyone, we're coming up on an hour. Uh, it was awesome hearing you know a lot of insights from different parts of. The industry, I know, you know, covering from co-living to multifamily to residential, we covered a lot of topics. So thank you, everyone. And really what we believe here at CrowdCreate is just, hey, you know, getting getting the wisdom of the crowds and, and getting ahead and just listening to what the experts are doing. So you can kind of learn from their lessons and their insight. So uh, we do have another real estate mastermind coming up on February 16th. So if you'd like to be a speaker on that, we'll, we're going to you know, bring in other, other thought leaders as well. Let us know, but super excited. Thank you everyone for your time and sharing your, um, some of your wisdom with us. We did our poll. I wanted to share the results. The the best place to find accredited (laughs) investors, people are saying referrals and (laughs) exactly what we're doing here, you know, connecting, connecting people, investors, project owners, founders, and that's actually what we do here at CrowdCreate. So, you know, definitely set up a call with us if you want to get connected to people like these on these panels. On these CrowdCreate Masterminds, we bring these thought leaders to the front of the room to share the insights with you. We believe in the wisdom of the crowds. Every week, we come to you with a new episode to share these insights to help you get ahead.